Uh, and we will now move on to Craig. Uh, so I hope you're there, Craig. And Craig's going to talk a bit about using R in an online distance learning module. Craig is from the University of Glasgow. Over to you, Craig. Perfect. Thank you. Is that shooting OK? Yeah. Perfect, brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so yeah, just before I begin, just a big thank you to the organisers for inviting me along today. Uh, I'm going to move that your screen sharing thing. <laughs> I'm sharing full screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk a bit about how to teach R, uh, specifically with online distance learning. Um, and my experiences of delivering an online distance learning course in R. Um, I am aware that due to a recent pandemic, most people here may have had experience teaching R, so some things I do cover may be old news to you, um, but the course was designed prior um, to this in 2017, so there are some things we've developed um, quite a while ago, but there's some new things we've learned along the way, and hopefully a couple of things that you may pick up as quite useful and I'd be quite keen to know what others are doing uh, if they're teaching in a similar fashion. So, oops, I don't know why that came up. Um, so just to begin, um, I'll just start talking about how in Glasgow we typically teach R on campus and then talk about moving to online. So we offer a series of introductory R courses here at the university. And they're typically delivered over a one semester basis. And these uh, used to consist of a mixture of lectures and lab sessions. Since the pandemic, the lectures have now actually been removed and it's more closely aligned to how we teach on the ODL programme. The lecture materials or the notes provided will cover the key concepts um, for that particular week's learning. Um, and then the lab will take place usually over a two hour period, which provides examples and practice in using R. The main advantage of course to the lab is it provides an opportunity for the students to raise any questions they may have to actually practice uh, within the lab using a device which has been set up and there's one-to-one -one help available from the staff and tutors with coding issues and debugging and from a tutor's perspective one of the good things about this I suppose is the ability to almost look over the shoulder and see that all too familiar red error message coming up and you can have a good gauge of the student's progress through the material so it's quite beneficial for the learner and actually those teaching. In terms of assessments these tend to take the form of some take-home assignments and class tests as well. So then moving on to teaching R online so this course that I'm currently teaching, which is called R Programming, this was first designed in 2017 by a former colleague, uh, and it forms part of our online distance learning, or ODL, um, Masters in Data Analytics at the university. The materials covered in this course are very similar to our other introductory courses, though there are additional areas that are explored, which I'll discuss a bit more. Uh, and this is covered over a slightly longer period of 11 weeks. Um, the materials provided are mostly asynchronous, so they're all available on a weekly basis, um, and we offer a live session uh, once a week, which runs for an hour, and I'll talk more about those individual components and what we do shortly. The assessment structure is quite similar to on campus, so it's a series of continuous assessments, but we do use some different styles of assessment types that lean into some of the adjustments we've made to how we teach the course. So that's just a quick tabular summary of what I was saying there, comparing the on-campus and ODL programmes, just in terms of what's offered. But the main real differences being the student interaction with the kind of lab session no longer there and replaced with a live session as well. Course materials themselves. Um, we have notes which are provided weekly and um, we now provide these in PDF in a nice new accessible HTML format and these work in a particular unit and each unit corresponds to a week's worth of learning. And the way the notes are designed is they will cover key concepts working through a particular week, say for example, um, if we look at data manipulation or building from the base concepts and what the data frame is and then moving on to different steps of the manipulation. And with each of these, there will be some examples alongside for the students to work through. We also provide um, video lectures which summarise uh, some of the key concepts for that week, usually with worked along examples too. 
and we are quite lucky that we get to record these in a nice custom-made recording room, which you can see here, which has this nice board as well. Um, the, we also, along with these learning materials, provide a set of review exercises. These are really meant to replicate what the student would experience in a lab session. So these are just a set of exercises for the student to review and work through, which tie in with the material for that particular week. With the review exercises too, we do also add um, video tutorials, um, which provide solutions with a detailed walkthrough of the problem. So not just providing the actual code, which is a sample solution, but working through this step by step, um, which has been um, found to be quite positive from the students that do enjoy just having someone talk through us line by line, um, which does help. So I mentioned uh, previously that we do have some additional units as well. Um, so it's very similar to the standard on-campus course, which covers the R basics of using R, handling data, visualization, then into more functional programming concepts. We do include some um, more data management using Tidyverse, so using more efficient data management functions, um, which tends to be quite popular with these students as some come with a bit of experience in R and mostly all use Tidyverse, so it's a bit more familiar and friendly for them. Some extra data visualization using ggplot, and then the two additional elements which I feel integrate quite well with an online program just due to the nature of how they work with uh, kind of automated report writing and R markdown, which we're looking to change to Quarto now, uh, so that's new and improved version, and um, application development using Shiny. And we'll talk more about the application development when we come to the assessment, as this forms one of the key assessment types as well. So in terms of assessment structure, um, in previous iterations of the course in the first few years, these mostly consisted of take-home assignments. Um, which work well in some sense, but have problems in the other. And the main problem is the effectiveness of kind of assessing student performance just for the use of Stack Overflow, which has become increasingly popular, and our new friend Chat GPT that's appeared, um, which, um, as was mentioned earlier, is a nice blog post and kind of uh, dealing with Chat uh, G GPT. Um, so we're trying to kind of move away from more than having mainly um, take home assessment types of students have the time to kind of look through this and we want to avoid these issues as much as possible. So for our current plan, we use a mixture of different assessment types. So we now use two time quizzes, which are in Moodle, which is our virtual learning environment. These tend to last two hours with a series of questions to the student's answer, where they'll provide the code, which would provide the solution. This is mainly focused in the initial weeks, which takes a look at kind of base R commands and data manipulation and visualization. There is still one take-home assignment as well, which looks more into functional programming, so constructing functions and using logical statements. And then a final project, which consists of the students developing a Shiny application, which I'll just talk more about now. Um, so the timed assignments have found these work quite well in minimising this potential use of online resources, i.e. students can't post a question to Stack Overflow and get an answer very quickly. Well, I've not seen one yet but um, this tends to minimise the effect of this somewhat as it is timed. And there's also a randomised element as well. So students have a different random set of questions. Um, one thing that did used to run within the programme, which was quite an effective assessment, was uh, Vivas, where students were uh, given a set of tasks to work through and ask questions and how they would do this in R. This assessment worked really well, but it required an intense amount of resources and the programme has grown and it's very difficult to schedule 60 plus fibers for people that live in multiple time zones. So as effectively being scrapped now, um, sadly. One of the main assessments and probably my favourite assessment, and I quite like this um, one within the course, is the final project. And the final project consists of the students developing their own Shiny application and what's nice about this assessment is it incorporates all the different units of the course. So we have them doing uh, work with data manipulation, looking at data visualization, also looking at coding their own functions uh, to put into their application and incorporating uh, R Markdown for a um, summary of some of the output of their application too. 
it's been well received by the students who in general feedback towards the end or when you speak to them later on down the line in the program they really like doing the shiny app at the time uh, afterwards as it feels quite an achievement um, but it is quite time consuming to mark as you can imagine scrolling through 800 lines of shiny code <laughs> um, but this is still probably one of the more kind of enjoyable and all encompassing assessments that is a part of the program we have recently added an opportunity for students to create a kind of smaller app for practice just to get up to speed with Shiny before they begin the main assessment. And this one on the right here was one a student made this year showing uh, distilleries in Scotland. So just sprinkling some more of that Scottish theme in the first half of the session today. So in terms of our interaction with the students and actually speaking to them in a synchronous manner, we do offer weekly live sessions um, these are typically run for an hour and um, try to find a time which suits most students, though this can be difficult due to the kind of international feel of an online distance learning program, finding a time which works for everyone. The sessions are generally structured to provide an overall review of the weekly materials covered uh, and including some live demonstrations of code and working through things as well. Um, the students are encouraged prior to raise any questions on particular units uh, or particular areas of that week uh, prior to the session so we can spend time covering that in detail so it's tailored as much to the students' needs uh, as possible. One thing I've recently incorporated in live sessions is using Google Colabs. Um, so I've provided an additional review task that we cover towards the end of the live session um, which is created on Google Colabs and Colabs is quite good now as it works with an R kernel so it's typically used for Python um, programming but you can uh, set it so it works with an R kernel and machine and you can use this quite well. What I find quite effective with this is it allows this integration of text in R a bit like a Jupyter notebook if you're familiar with this into just kind of one document and it saves this multiple switching between different screen views um, and one thing I'm looking into doing for the upcoming year is looking at a weekly summary, which will um, integrate into Colabs as well. So instead of going through a typical summary with slides in the R console, looking to kind of merge these two things together for the next versions of the course. And I'll quickly just jump off here to actually show you one said Colab. So this here is just one um, live session activity we have. So we have the task here. And prior to this, we can press this play button, which then will run the above command. So it'll load in this data and load in the libraries as well. It's taking quite a bit of time, so it may not work perfectly for me. But then you can ask the question here. And usually this is provided empty beforehand, so the students can attempt uh, this, but it won't save a copy so they can work in this themselves prior to the session. During the session, I'll then provide the code and update this, where this will then run and produce said uh, plots like below and down here as well. So this is basically how I'm using Colabs in the live sessions, uh, just to kind of integrate the flow of the two different tasks together a bit better. So we'll go back to the slides now. So on top of uh, the live sessions as well, in different ways to communicate to the students to try and replicate as much as the lab, which we tend to miss out on, which is one of the bigger things in a programming course, I find. Um, there is an opportunity for students to raise questions on the virtual learning environment as well with weekly forums. Um, in previous iterations, we've run this with Teams, but it didn't seem to work quite as well. So forums on Moodle has worked well. And in my experience teaching the course, what's quite nice is the students are quite engaged with one another and willing to support each other, um, providing answers, which not only makes my life easier as it's less questions to answer, but it's good just having the different viewpoints and the different ways of answering and approaching a question. Um, I would say this is maybe perhaps unique to the ODL program compared to your more on campus programs, um, just from my experience. Also offer the opportunity as well for students to have a one to one uh, appointment with the course lecturing team as well to discuss any questions that they have in detail. So there is that additional option provided too. So now onto some possible issues and things that crop up. Uh, so using R remotely, um, and this is something I definitely found more experience with with teaching replications of on-campus courses. 
uh, during COVID and less so in ODL, but problems are starting to creep up a bit more. So using R and all of its different associated packages when you're teaching, um, it's inevitable that some technical issues can appear with the kind of capability of a student's device, particularly with R Markdown and Tiny Tech, which um, I could do a whole talk on, but we'll leave that for now. Um, on this particular course, the occurrences tend to be quite few as the students have their own device and there's a bit more freedom, but this does happen and has happened quite a bit this year. So there's some different considerations and ways around this we've looked at. One that's not listed here is a virtual machine that's offered by the university as well that the students can use to run R on, which has uh, most of the installed packages available. This does require updating between the university IT team and ourselves, so it can be a bit slow. Using virtual machines as well, or just using pages like Colabs, like is shown here, um, is good and can have the students working through and on the code. Though it's perhaps not ideal for assignments and kind of particularly things such as the final project. RStudio Cloud is an, quite a popular workaround, uh, which provides a cloud-based service for RStudio. The advantages with this are if you can set your own development environments, you can load in the packages the students require, Students can then specify a project for things they're working on, so it integrates really well with tasks. The downside, of course, is this costs money, and it really is more of a resourcing issue and just depending on what's available. Um, there are tools as well, such as LearnR, which we use quite a lot in our undergraduate courses, which integrates a small R console into a lab you develop via Shiny, so this can be a work-along lab the students use. Problem with this, it can become a bit messy with some of the more advanced concepts in the course, particularly developing Shiny apps is a bit difficult to do within this console, but can be useful for those earlier stage units um, and particularly more in undergraduate courses incorporating kind of introductory R material. So some, just to round up some ideas um, for the future that I am considering to incorporate within the course, um, which I have some pros and cons with on both sides. And the main motivation of these ideas really is more student interaction and trying to replicate a bit more of that, um, I guess, student lab, what you have in the lab with a few people working together and kind of collaborating. So I'm lo looking at two different activities to try and incorporate, which uh, sound ideal on paper, but may have their own issues. And one of the first is code reviewing. Um, so looking into a peer review based activity, which would have the students reviewing um, a selection of other students' codes uh, using a design feedback rubric, then looking with some reflection on the feedback they've received. The possibility there is to integrate with the take home assignment after this has been submitted, and then kind of supplying the students with different uh, versions of certain questions. Um, which allows the students to be exposed to the different ways certain problems uh, can be tackled. This ties in quite well with this assignment as it's more functional programming based, so there's more scope for a different range of approaches to how the problem solved, or potentially during the final project. But as mentioned before, uh, reviewing Shiny applications may be a bit messy to do. So this is one thing I'm potentially looking into next year to try and kind of improve that student interaction rate and have them kind of analyzing look at others code as well. And the second thing um, to look at is changing the project from an individual project and into a group based project to develop a shiny application. They tend to be over the past few years of kind of setting this project students do spend a lot of time on the project. Um, and it can be quite time consuming for them. Also time consuming for the staff that mark the project to as you're marking a lot of individual projects. There is a potential there to move this into a group based assignment with a group developing an application and looking at collaboratively building an app together. This, to do this effectively would have, I feel kind of potential to incorporate using additional skills such as Git and GitHub, which is currently something we don't teach in the programme, but we have within the university looking at developing a short GitHub course. So this could potentially link with this. And um, there are other ways to work around this, but it seems probably the best environment for kind of a collaborative coding based project. 
The downside, though, I feel is it might be quite messy, uh, just because shiny apps can be very complex. I think you would need a clear structure as to which component each member of the group works on, as changing one small part of a shiny app can just break the whole thing down. So it's an idea in my mind I have in principle as being potentially uh, fun to explore, but could be uh, laden with problems. But these are two kind of ideas I'm looking into to kind of increase that kind of collaboration between the students within the course. Um, and that is everything really I wanted to cover today as the room, the lights in my room just went off due to a sensor. Um, so that was perfect time. And so thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. That's great. Thank you very much, Craig, uh, no for that. Um, I can see a couple of quest questions already. So Mark, quick question for you. Do you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, Craig, you might have said, you probably said this, but I just missed it. The st who who are the students? I mean, what are what are their what are their backgrounds? What 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 level are they at? What what's the subject that they're studying? No, uh, good point, Mark. I actually probably didn't go into enough detail regarding the students. So the students in this program are part-time online distance learning masters um in data analytics. So the students tend to be in full-time employment. Uh they tend to, quite a few of them tend to already have some light experience in data science. Um, some of them have quite a heavy programming background, so tend to have almost more knowledge than myself right. <laughs> on R, which can be quite daunting. But there is quite a mix of ability level from complete novice to quite an expert in programming across the course. So, yeah, that's the general kind of demographic of the students. And in terms of age range, it's very varied as well. Um, quite a wide age range, quite a wide kind of global coverage in terms of where the students are from. So quite right. different to your kind of a typical on campus course in terms of demographic. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, thanks, Craig. Uh, one thing that occurred to me, while I I'm not sure that everyone is going to be familiar with Google Colabs. Do you think you could perhaps do a, a brief intro at Perhaps with a comparison to Markdown, because it's obviously got some things in common with Markdown, but yeah. not entirely the same. That might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So Google Colabs is basically an online collaborative programming platform, um, which takes the form of a Python notebook. So for those of you perhaps familiar with Python, it's pretty much identical to Jupyter and its behavior. Um, in terms of a comparison with Markdown, its behavior is quite similar, but it's more interactive in the sense that when you're on Colabs, you can add text boxes um, to then create like text, um, kind of add images, etc. Then other boxes for a console, which would run like an R console. Similarly, in behavior to how you would create an R markdown document where you have your text, you then have your console block, which runs the code. Whereas in this case, you're actually running the code live, which is probably the main difference between the two. Okay, thank you very much. The other thing that just occurred to me while, uh, if by the way, if anyone else does has questions, please just put them in the chat. But just looking at your um, uh, your slides, uh, I, I think there was there may be quite a lot of kit envy going on, having seen your room where where you um, yeah. uh, where you you do your videos. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, clearly a lot of money has been spent on that, and I guess most of us over the last few years have got used to. Are producing videos on a laptop or something is it you know would you advise is it worth other universities spending money to do that do you think so i think in terms of the so in terms of most of the things that we cover in the course you can replicate this using um your own um device like your own device like you said kind of recording your own lectures the one thing having that recording facility does is it just adds quite a professional sheen to the quality of the videos and allows you to just integrate and incorporate different things like making the video with the kind of high quality video with an R console actually working there. Um, I think it makes quite a difference to our program and just the general quality of materials. So I would be inclined to recommend it, but of course, convincing universities to do this may be a little bit difficult um, but I think it's um, it's paid dividends for us and it's really kind of made the kind of process smoother I think it just makes the course look a lot nicer and more accessible. Uh, and just one final comment in the chat someone's talked about using Codio to allow students to work with our studios is that something you've come across? 
Codio. I've heard of the name. Um, no, actually. So I'd be quite interested to look into that a bit more. Uh, so that has been noted. Uh, okay. Have a Google at that afterwards. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, so we're going to take a five minute break now. So my clock says it's just gone. It's now two minutes past three. So we will start again at seven minutes past three uh, with uh, with Andy and then with Mark. So see you in five minutes.